And we are live here in the Storycraft Cafe. I am your host, Hank Garner, as always. And today, I am super excited to have Kate Golden on the show with me. She has an amazing new release that just re-released yesterday. If you're hearing this live on October the 11th, it came out on the 10th, which was yesterday. The The first book in this new series is called A Dawn of Onyx, and it is the first book in the Sacred Stones series. Book two uh, is following up pretty quickly as far as, um, you know, traditional publishing, uh, you know, time frames go, and it's coming out in the spring. So if you get into this book and you love it, you don't have long to wait for book number two to come out. I, I say that this book was re-released because Kate initially published it as an indie release, and it took on a life of its own with, as it gathered a uh, an audience on social media and just really took off like wildfire and as kate is going to share with us i'm sure in just a minute um you know all of the hilarity that ensued that now brings us to uh this major publishing release and you know followed up by sequels and all of that good stuff welcome to the show kate oh my gosh thank you so much <laughs> Uh, Kate, I love to start the show with a fun question to to kind of get us started. And one thing that I love to ask people is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, man, that's a great question. Um, first memory. Oh, it's so embarrassing, but I feel like I have to go with the real <laughs> first one. I around like six, seven, eight, I wrote like princess stories that I then sold to my family. Like I made them it. buy them from me, <laughs> even though <laughs> I was, you know, I was like, they would have taken them anyway, but. So, um, so you started indie publishing at an early age. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> right. yeah. I was quite the hustler. I set up like a little bookstore in my room. I'm like, this is the princess section. And that was the only section. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the other sections are under construction. Yes, exactly. I love it. So did you have a supportive family? Did, you know, did they play along nicely? <laughs> yes, they, they were rapid fans. They were like pre-orders and everything. Um, oh, yeah, it. they were, I come from like a family of, um, both my parents worked, work slash worked in the, um, movie industry. So they love stories and storytelling and, you know, um, yeah, they were really supportive. Interesting. So they both worked in the, in the, or work in the movie industry, like, on what side of the industry? My mom was a studio executive and then okay. she retired to have kids um, in like the eighties. And my dad is a, a producer still actually. Nice. So, yeah. so story um, was a formative part of, 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 of family life that, that had to be uh, wild having, you know, creative parents and being around the art of storytelling. I, I can only imagine. Yeah, it was, you know, it was really, to me, it was really normal. And then I sort of grew up and was like, that's not normal. But, you know, everything was always tied to, you know, great stories and film and television and books. And, you know, all the advice I get from my dad is like, well, this is why all the great stories are about this thing, because it's, you know, human experience. I'm like, dad, I just need advice on, you know, this work situation. He's like, well, you look at this, you know, it's Shakespeare. It's great tragedy. Like they're, they're so always talking about story. I mean, by the way, you have, I don't know if people can see us, but you have saved the cat on your shelf. I mean, I feel like they were telling me about save the cat when I was like a kid. I'm actually working on a video series on uh, oh, the save cool. the cat method. So that's, that's why it's sitting on my shelf there. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. In, it's great. A great resource that has helped me so, absolutely. so, 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 you know, a lot of people, um, I I've done over 1500 author interviews over the last decade and you hear so many times that, that people give you advice about following a creative pursuit but also have something to fall back on, you know, which is, which is not terrible advice, you know, because, um, you need to be able to pay bills, you know, that's, that's just a fact of life. And, and while we all want to pursue this dream, you know, that there are real life circumstances that have to be taken care of. Um, did you get that sort of traditional <laughs> advice from your parents having, the, the kind of creative family that, that you come from? Yes, very much so. Um, 
And I'm really grateful to them because I think also the, you know, the experience that you get, not only just, you know, working a, a sort of day to day job, obviously, but, but sure. having to do something while you having to do something to pay your bills while you pursue the thing you love, I think helps you do the thing that you love yeah. because you're meeting people and you're out there in the world. I mean, writing, creating can be a very solitary experience. You just get life experience. So yes, my, my parents were <laughs> very, um, very adamant that like I, I start working at a young age because it's what they both did. So I got my first job at like 15. I actually I feel like maybe some of the like romance girlies who listen to this might recognize this, but my first job was working at a clothing store called Brandy Melville which is now very popular, but at the time there was like one location and I worked there all throughout high school. And then, you know, always had like some kind of like, you know, sales associate job or I was a waitress or whatever, because I think, you know, it was, it was something that was important to my parents. And I'm really glad that um, they, they wanted that for me because I learned a lot from it. And then obviously now in adulthood, I've also have a full-time job that sure. I do while I write. <laughs> right. Right. And there, there's something to be said about, um, the day job and the importance of of it taking the pressure off of your creative cool. expression um you know I, I i feel like so many times we we hate the the day job um you know we were like oh i can't wait to get rid of this thing so that i can be a free creative person you know and and what what we fail to realize is that the day job gives us the freedom to do that because mm -hmm. we don't it, we don't require this creative expression to to carry all the weight of everything and it can just be what it is and um i i, I think there, there's too much pressure on dividing life up and and this part of our life is at odds with this part of our life and i don't i don't know that's that's just something i've been thinking about lately no, I think I actually, I feel like you've been sitting in on my, on my conversations <laughs> with my, you know, my husband and my friends. It's, it's so, so, so true. Um, you know, I think that there's some kind of pressure we put on ourselves that you haven't really made it in your creative pursuit until it can pay for your life or, right. or your bills or your rent or whatever. But I, I think you're so, it's such an astute observation that as soon as that becomes the case, now the thing you love has to pay for your life. I mean, right. there's an insane amount of pressure on that. And I think it was Emily Henry in Beach Read. She wrote about how, you know, writing is like the greatest thing ever. And then as soon as you're on deadline or as soon as somebody needs your next draft, it feels like doing tax forms or something. It's like right. suddenly all that pressure can strip, can, not always, but like can strip a lot of the creative joy away. Um, Especially if you're like a really ambitious person, suddenly it's like, well, I have to be great at this because it's the thing I do for a living, not the thing that I do for fun or like a hobby, you know, or a thing that brings me joy. Um, you know, it's like there's now professional pressure to succeed or the whatever the creative version of like getting promoted or whatever. Um, yeah. But it's also hard because there's just not very, you know, there's not enough hours in the day. I don't know. Right. If like you, but it's like it's hard to, you know. If I could, I think I would do lots and lots of things because then everything would feel right. there'd be less pressure on everything. You know? Exactly. Exactly. Um, I've uh, of all the authors that I've met over the years, uh, I can probably count on two hands the number of people who held writing as a singular pursuit. Um, mm -hmm. They knew from the time they were a teenager, I'm going to be a novelist. And then every decision that was made in life was to further that uh, that pursuit and, you know, they went to school and studied creative writing and, you know, immediately started writing novels and submitting them, you know, and it's just the only thing that they ever, um, you know, held as a possibility. And those are a, a, a vast minority. Yeah. Most people I've discovered have kind of a circuitous route, you know, to that brings them to to writing. And, you know, you go over and you collect some life experience over here and you meet people over here and relationships and, and not that we do things to collect experiences that we will, you know, use in our novel, but they just happen, you know, and mm -hmm. you're just you're just filling up your writer toolbox all the time. Um, do I understand correctly that when you first started writing your first novel, um, this was not something on your mind at all, but 
was kind of a challenge from your uh, <laughs> fiance boyfriend who is now your husband. Do, do I have that right? Oh my God. Yeah. Wow. You, you have it totally right. I, I didn't even know you knew that. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I absolutely fall not into that category. Those 10 fingers. Um, I wrote those books like as a kid, I did a lot of creative stuff as a kid, just as I think a lot of kids do. It was, you know, fun and would make home videos, whatever. Never actually yeah. thought I would write, never went to school for it, never took a creative writing class. Um, but I loved reading, still love reading, obviously. Um, and yeah, it was a weird, I was on a vacation with my then fiance and had brought, you know, as you do on like a beach vacation, I'm not good at just like sitting still. So I brought like 15 books. Sure. I'm like, I'll read all these books on vacation. Right. And it was just one of those like weird things. I started a bunch of chapters and like couldn't get into any of them and was venting about it at dinner. Like, I don't like any of my books. And um, <laughs> <laughs> it was like so stupid. I don't know. It's like, we've all been there. It's like, I just- We've all been there. Yeah. <laughs> and my- um fiance was like, well, you know, you love story and you work in, you know, a story related field, you know, for a living. Why don't you write the thing that you want to read, you know, just for you? And I just thought it sounded fun and I didn't really like have a book to read. So I thought, okay, I'll do that on vacation. And I, I totally felt like head over heels in love with it. It was the most fun thing I'd ever done in my life. I love it. So, so <laughs> walk me through the process. How did you start? Did you, did you just start pantsing a story and yeah. oh, pulling my. things out of the ether? Did you start trying to construct a, a plot? Uh, like, where did your mind go in the beginning when when you kind of received this challenge? How, how do you begin? Where where did it start? Totally. Um, well, definitely not pantsing. I don't think I've done anything spontaneous ever in my life. <laughs> not once. So this is honestly trying to write a book is probably the closest I've ever come to that. Um, but no, no pantsing. I, um, I'm trying to think the first thing I think I did was I was talking about, okay, here are the things that make me love a book. You know, what are, okay. what are the sort of some tropes, but also just like the type of characters, the type of tone, you know, what are the things that make up that all my favorite books have in common? And then what are things that I never see that I wish that I did, you know, what am I looking for, but I can never seem to find. And I tried to just like, I think I made a list of all those things. And then I tried to, you know, back my way into what kind of story would allow me to get all of these things for myself. Um, and then once I had that, the story kind of started coming together. You know, it, it was like I had the, I actually had the plot first and the characters second, which is not, I think, normally how most at least from the you know podcast interviews i've listened to or read you know how most writers find it but it was sort of a weird way of getting into it so i had the plot then i sort of found the characters then i did like a really hefty outline and kind of thought maybe it would end there that like once i had the outline i'd feel like i had read my story and i would go back to being a reader um but then once i had the outline i just like wanted to write it so badly so that's what it did what was the you said the the plot came to you first um so i'm one thing that I'm fascinated by is where stories begin, uh, yeah. because in in one moment, um, a dawn of onyx does not exist in in any form or fashion. But then you start maybe playing the what if game, and you know, well, what if this happened? And and I love how you said um, that you you took tropes that you loved, but then thought of elements that that maybe you didn't see and would like to see, and um, one thing that I think uh, new writers especially kind of get lost on is if you start talking about tropes and and things that, you know, story structure things. And they, you know, a, a lot of people will say, well, you're just you're taking all the fun out of it, you know, and by by trying to identify, you know, the things that you need. And it just it's going to become formulaic. But there are things that that make story story, but it's what it's the new things that you bring to it that really set it off. Um, so I love that you said that. That was just a, a side note that I just wanted to mention. Um, yeah. But, you know, so maybe you start playing the what if game and you start saying, you know, well, you know, I, I, I like stories like this, but what if this happened? And then somewhere in that process, uh, a character walks onto the stage of your mind and you start kind of casting this plot with people that just show up out of the ether or whatever. And then at some point in that process, uh, a dawn of onyx does exist, and then it's your job as the writer 
to to dig it out and excavate it and dust yeah. it off and polish it up and you know and then bring a book you know into the world from that so what was that first moment of creation like for you i love the way you described that that's so so accurate um that like that's exactly what the experience feels like um so when i you know as you said you know feeling like it started with the plot for me that was because so many of these books that i loved started with that Beauty and the Beast, Hades and Persephone. It's the girl that ends up, you know, trapped or captured or stuck with this man who is, seems like one thing to the rest of the world, but either he's always been something else and she finds that or he becomes something else from being with her. You know, it's like that, that story I always love. And I think that's why a lot of, you know, there's so much popularity now around the morally gray hero or the villain that is off for the girl. I think there's something, you know, that's really what I love. So I was like, okay, how can I take a girl and plop her somewhere that she can't, you know, leave with somebody who seems very villainous, but of course would, you know, do anything for her at some point. And that, so that was sort of like the, the structure that I loved that I wanted to, to emulate or imitate the sort of original part, or at least it it felt original to me was, and I hope this isn't like a, an overshare. Um, but I have anxiety. I suffer from these like terrible panic attacks I have since I was really young. Um, and I never see that in, you know, it's like these book heroines are like, they're so strong. They're like, being beaten and they're kept in cages and they're, you know, using their powers and they're, they never break a sweat. And I always feel like, man, I couldn't, I would have a panic attack. I would not be able to, you know, handle any of this. And I rarely felt like I was reading books where the heroes, you know, or the heroines had the the anxiety that I had. And, you know, I've, I've been to a lot of therapy and I've gone to cognitive behavioral therapy and what you know, is a sort of common understanding about panic attacks is it's just like, it's a surge of adrenaline, which Mm -hmm. your body is actually creating to protect you. Your body thinks that something is wrong and it's giving you the fuel to obviously to fight or to flee and protect yourself. So even though you feel like, man, I'm so weak, I'm so afraid, your body is actually very strong. It's trying to take care of you. And I liked that idea that like, I could have a heroine who has anxiety and suffers from panic attacks from, you know, childhood trauma, from whatever, but actually that that could be tied in the long run. I don't think this is a spoiler. This is, you know, whatever. Yeah. To her inherent power to like something that she doesn't quite know about herself yet, but over the course of the trilogy becomes what makes her strong and unique and powerful. And I, that I sort of liked that. And I personally, a lot of my anxiety, I get very claustrophobic. So I'm like, man, if I was a prisoner, if I got taken prisoner by, you know, a beast or a Hades character or whatever, right. I would feel trapped. I'd feel very anxious. So that was sort of how the story came about is that like I had this image of this girl who had, you know, panic disorder like I did in the dungeon of a wicked guy. And then I got to combine the two things I, I was interested in. So that was sort of and then at that point, I was like, OK, now I have my girl. She's kind of sheltered. She's not your average, you know, ass kicking Katniss Everdeen hero. Maybe she'll get there, hopefully, right. but she's not there when we start. And that was sort of like how the, the story that was the moment of inception. Well, sometimes I, I, I completely agree with with what you said about um, the the need for relatability in characters because um sometimes the challenges that you give a character um define them even more than their than their powers or their Mm -hmm. you know the thing that um it's it's how we deal with those and if by giving our characters believable challenges and hurdles and things that they have to um you know succeed in spite of or maybe uh, because of um, that, that's what makes characters memorable, and that's what makes readers fall in love with characters. So I think it's really cool that e- early in the process, this was resonating with you, and and that that you knew there had to be something for readers to hold on to. Um, how long did this kind of planning process take um, before you realized, okay, well, I've got a, a pretty well fleshed out you know skeleton to this story now let me start writing it how how long did that planning and pre-writing phase take i think i did the whole outline on like the you know six days we were on vacation (laughs) i like i but i also it was like so i felt really obsessed and was like waking up early on my laptop and you know i was i i was totally hooked 
So I think I, I did the outline then. And, you know, not to go back to the save the cat thing, but that, you know, story structure is a, mm -hmm. a big part of what I do for, for a living. So it felt like some of the stuff I, I was like, okay, I, I'll find my midpoint and I'll get my, my you know, what's my big third act conflict going to be? And how do I relate that to my inciting incident? All that stuff that was sort of like, not so tricky. It was the, you know, when I got back from the vacation and I had this sort of outline going in and making sure that, you know, all, all my character beats were working and my, you know, um, character arcs were strong enough and that it was creative enough. I mean, that was the hardest part for me. You know, I knew I wanted something really, you know, really dangerous to happen here. And I had all the versions of the books I had read, but then I wanted to come up with my own version. And I'm, I didn't think I was a writer then. So I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. So those, that probably took me another like couple weeks once I got home, you know, filling in the gaps, places I'd left blank where I knew what I wanted to happen, but I hadn't come up with it yet. And I honestly, I listened to a lot of podcasts on writing and, and um, there's like a lot of, you know, Brandon Sanderson has like his whole class he's taught on YouTube. Oh, yeah. I like that whole thing. And what I learned was that if you're, well, I don't know if this is true, but I found it true for myself. If you're trying to just pull something out of thin air, you've already, like, you've already missed a step in which, you know, if you're trying to come up with what creature, you know, does this thing, you're not supposed to be able to just think of something that should be born out of your world, your characters, the the kind of setup you're already in. And so I would have to right. go back and then I'd be able to go forward. That probably took another, like, three weeks or so. Then I was able to just, like, kick on. <laughs> We, we talk a lot about the gift of anonymity, uh, especially mm -hmm. in the beginning, um, because you the way you describe this, there's so much joy that just sounds like it comes from just the the process of discovery. And, you know, th this was not something that there was any pressure on. This was just something you did because you wanted to do it, because you love story and you just wanted to do it and there were no expectations on it and uh you you brought up uh brandon sanderson he has been on the show before and, and we talked about um that he wrote 13 novels before he ever got published and and uh, i asked him well what do you think would have happened if you never got published and he said well my kids would have inherited my house when i died and there would be novels stuffed in mm -hmm. every closet everywhere that i had just written because i was going to write whether anyone bought them or not you know kind of like uh some people go to the ymca and play basketball a couple of nights a week and we don't ask them when they're going to start playing for the nba they just it's just what they do for fun you know so that that gift of not having any pressure on it and just writing for the love of it. Um, at what point did you realize, okay, I think I've got something here. This is, this is an actual book with a, uh, with a story arc and, you know, it, it looks like it has series potential. Like when did you start taking this thing, you know, from just, this is a, a fun thing I'm doing to, I think I might have something here. Um, yeah, I just want to say really quickly, that is so, um, it, it, you've so hit the nail on the head on that experience, like the way you described it, how, and I, I guess Brandon did as well, like the joy when they're, when it's just yours and yeah. nobody knows and that, you know, I, I'm new to this. I haven't done a lot of these, but I've just like, I'm so, it, it's a very cathartic feeling when someone can articulate this thing that you've been experiencing, you know, for so right. long. Um, but that was ex exactly to a T what it felt like. And I said that to the only person who knew was my husband or my fiance. Yeah. And I said that to him, I was like, I didn't think I'd ever share with that with anyone. So I said to him, you know, I hope, you know, I'm just going to be doing this for the rest of my life. I'm just going to be <laughs> writing these. And, well, the only person who's going to read them are you, um, or is you, uh, I think the shift for me was, I'm trying to remember. I mean, I, I knew it was going to be a trilogy when I was outlining it because okay. there was too much story to tell and i also i like a trilogy and i wanted sure. to you know, end on a cliffhanger not that that's a spoiler you'll see that in reviews <laughs> but I, I that's how i liked it so that i knew i knew the whole trilogy and i knew how i wanted the books to end then um i think what happened was i wrote it and i was too i didn't even want to give it to my husband i was like what if it's terrible and then i put you in the position of having to lie to me like i didn't want to do that so I found like an anonymous, you know, on Reddit, there's like a subreddit for beta readers where you just find, you know, lovely internet strangers who for free will just read your book. It's like the kindest place ever. Right. Um, 
And I just wanted someone to tell me if it was atrocious or not. And, you know, had a handful of people read it who were so kind and so um, their, their feedback was really thoughtful and they were really complimentary and they said, you should try to publish this. And I think that was when something shifted for me. And actually that group of people, they still read. I, they actually are reading the third book right now. Oh, <laughs> I you, love it. Like, I love and it. they were really, you know, it was like a bunch of kindred spirits and a really lovely group of people. Um, but yeah, they, they said this might be something. And then at that point I was like really addicted to book talk as I think a lot of people were. And so I made a couple little teasers of like scenes from my book and they just sort of, got a ton of views and people were saying, when does this come out? And I'm like, come out. <laughs> this is in my brain. What do you think? <laughs> um, and then I guess I had to sort of figure out what to do. That was yeah. So you initially indie published this book and, uh, and uh, indie publishing uh, has, uh, you know, is, is having a moment. Uh, well, it's, it's been having a moment for the last yeah. decade uh, ever since the Kindle revolution really is you, when, Amazon and Amazon KDP sort of leveled the playing field in a lot of ways and, and gave people the opportunity to get stories out there that maybe haven't had an opportunity yet. And we can debate the ups and downs and the, the pros and cons of indie versus traditional publishing. And, and uh, my idea is that they're both absolutely valid and they have different places and um, you know, they're people can choose which one, uh, they want to do for any number of reasons. And, and, yeah. you know, you or I, or, or whoever is not here to judge, um, mm -hmm. you know, somebody's choice. Uh, but, um, you, you had a very, uh, particular experience. You indie published this book, you started, uh, gaining an audience on social media, like we said, and, um, there came a point where it was just kind of overwhelming, um, the, the, the whole process and, you know, one thing we don't think about when you indie publish is that you are everything in the process. You are mm -hmm. the writer, you are the editor in, in a lot of cases. I mean, there, there are lots of editors you can hire, um, but you are uh, the publisher. You you wear all of these hats. What what was that experience like? Oh, man, it was really hard. <laughs> <laughs> it was I, I mean. This is, I, I don't know, this is not going to paint me in the, in the most fantastic light, but I, I actually chose to indie publish because I thought it would be easier, which was foolish and probably lazy, <laughs> but I definitely learned my lesson. <laughs> I, I was like looking down the barrel of querying my book and it just seemed like the most difficult experience that it was going to take me years. I honestly was really, I was really fearful it would strip the joy out of it. I, I think a lot of people have those same fears. Yeah, I, you're right. And I didn't know that. And I didn't have any, I, none of my friends or family knew I was doing this. I was only everything, you know, it's like when you feel sick and you WebMD it and it's like, you're dying. That was my <laughs> right. experience. Anything I feared, I would just Google. And then you have a ton of people saying, oh yeah. my God, it's been horrible, you know, whatever. So I, I felt afraid and was like, well, if I just indie publish it, you know, the, the world will decide for me, you know, whether they like it or not. Yeah. Um, and then obviously I learned that as that exactly as you said, it's really difficult, not only marketing your own book and being your own publicist and making all of the, you know, Instagrams and the ads, but also the actual, you know, formatting of the book and the covers yeah. and the maps. And I mean, it's, it's a huge amount of work. I have so, so, so much, I mean, appreciation for the authors that some of my favorite authors that do that full time, that just are yeah. full the authors. Um, it's an enormous amount of work. Um, yeah. So that, that was, it was very tough and really hard to do with a full time job, which I know a lot of these indie authors have as well. Um, yeah. And at a certain point, I think what, what brought me into traditional publishing was that I was just getting too many, um, there were like too many incoming calls about or like emails about, you know, my an audiobook or like foreign translation. And I didn't know how to do those deals myself. And I didn't really know what or how to go about, you know, saying yes to certain people or no or book boxes, whatever. I ended up reaching out to a friend who worked in publishing and asked her, like, are these things real? What do you think? And she was like, We gotta get you an agent. So that was how that happened. So you you came to traditional publishing because you had a need 
for to get other people involved it sounds like um yeah i had actually i had been someone from a um publishing house had reached out to me and asked for the manuscript and that was actually the one where i sent it to a friend and said should i just send okay. this person my manuscript and she said oh no you need an agent first you can't do your own deals so that was sort of how i ended up getting an agent and then and then it sort of went from there gotcha so uh the book is republished um by berkeley is, yeah is that right and mm -hmm. just came out yesterday um what was so you have a finished manuscript you have a book that people have read and now berkeley says we would like to republish this book how do you take an existing book that that has a you know i don't know what size audience that you had but but you had people that were attached yeah. to this book um what, what's that process like to you know when you know now you're going to bring it into a publishing house and what what happens from there yeah i mean berkeley was so wonderful it it was like it was like a fairy godmother a publishing fairy godmother <laughs> they were really supportive of what was important the only thing that really mattered to me was that i had people i published it in december of 2022 and had told a lot of readers book two is coming it's coming you know in the spring it's coming in the summer and i had been writing it and i felt like a monster you know telling them actually <laughs> it be a couple years like that would have been for me so devastating if i had read a yeah. book and really liked it and then had to wait forever so berkeley was like okay we can get it out by april of 2024 and i think all these conversations happened like january of this year so that felt like only a year away, a year and some change. It was like the following spring didn't feel so terrible. So that was, you know, they were like, we're going to do that. And then we're going to release the third book later in 2024. So all books will be out by the end of next year. And that also felt like a, a win for an audience that was going to have to wait longer for the yeah. second one. Um, so one. So that was sort of like the thing that I was the biggest hurdle. They didn't really want to make edits to the book, which I would have been totally game for, but that was also, you know, encouraging. Um, obviously it went through copy edits and proofreading, which I had, I had had like a proofreader, a really wonderful proofreader that I had found um, online, but like I hadn't had um, yeah. somebody go through in sort of the same way. So that was really helpful. And then, you know, there was like, they, they redid the cover, which was cool. They did, they kept the same sort of heart and soul of it, but gave it sort of a shiny new makeover. And then, um, and then we jumped into book two. So I already had my manuscript of book two written. So I sent that to them. And then my editor um, at Berkeley, who is like an incredible genius, um, jumped in at that stage to fully, you know, give me revisions. And I went into the editing process. And um, so that one will be like really a Berkeley original that has gone through the whole traditional publishing process. You said that the the first book didn't go through any real uh, structural edits, but book two did. Um, yeah. Do did you did you see that there were? Um, I, I guess what I'm asking is in in book two because now it's it's a it's a a book of its own, but it also attaches to book one. It has to leave things open for book three. It's a, mm -hmm. it, it's an it's an entity of its own, but it's more than that because it's a yeah. it's a piece of a of a bigger whole. Also, was the editing process in in light of those situations? You know, not only is it a book, but it also has to, you know, it's a bridge between, uh, you know, right in the middle of a trilogy. Did the trilogy aspect? Did that bring editing challenges or things that? that you hadn't really thought through or maybe did, did the editing process help you um, conceptualize the whole thing better? Like, like what did you get out of the editing process in light of it being a trilogy? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I was really glad to have a teammate, honestly. That's sort of one of the great things about having an, an editor um, that you trust because there were so many big questions, you know, things were in chapter one of the second book. I'm like, do I have to say this to lead up so that in chapter 36 of the third right. book, this makes sense, you know, right. all those kind of things. It's really helpful to have other people thinking about it too, because you're bound to, you know, <laughs> make a mistake or have to fix something in the proofreading process. Um, I think also in some ways, 
having an editor and, and going through that was helpful because it, it took pressure off. There were times where I'm like, I got to set this up now so people know it's not retcon, you know, so people know that I was thinking about it. Right. And she's like, it's too much information. Give your reader some credit. Like they can wait until the third book to learn this. And that was actually really helpful because I think we ended up cutting the second book down by, I, I don't know, almost like 20,000 words, which was very necessary because it was long. <laughs> it was way too long. Um, so yeah, it was it was really helpful, um, and I think just in general, it's it was an incredibly helpful process having an editor because um, I think my biggest struggle is that I tend to rush. I sort of I know what I want it to be, and I just want to yeah. get there. And I think it's helpful having someone else say, "Slow, slow, slow, <laughs> slow down here. Add more here. Give your reader a chance to get there." Because I'm always like, you know, I know what's right. going. Let's just go there. You right. know, and so in the in the when you think of a trilogy, you want to do that all the time because I'm like I know where it's going anyway. So it was it was very helpful. Yeah. Well, and also the um the type of book this is with a uh, fantasy uh fantasy romance, yes, but in in fantasy, one of the hallmarks of that is is world building, and yeah. um one reason people love to read fantasy is because they want to fall into a world and and just experience all the all the detail, all the lushness of this and that. And, um, you know, it's just one thing that we fantasy readers love and, um, slowing down when, especially when you have a, a plot driven story where you know where you want to go, but giving people that experience that one of the reasons they come to fantasy, um, that's a, that's a tough thing to balance sometimes where I want to get there, but I want to yeah. give the readers everything they come to it for. Totally. Oh my gosh, totally. And, and especially when, you know, the world building, I think is the hardest, it's the hardest yeah. part for me for that exact reason. It's like, you know, if you were to try, I'm not even going to go with that example. That was too convoluted. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's a world I know, like the back of my hand. And I have to constantly remind myself that my reader doesn't know it like I do, you know, so I'll just use a word. And then I'm like, oh, I should probably tell them what that means. <laughs> Yeah. So, so book one's out now. Book two comes out uh, after the first of the year. What's the, the what's the title of book two? Uh, a promise of Peridot. A promise of Peridot. Do we have a title for book three yet, or is yes, it still in the works? I don't think I can share it. Okay. All right. It has well, not been we'll... announced yet, so I'm gonna. I don't want to get in trouble, but gotcha. it. But I'm sure we'll be sharing it soon. <laughs> gotcha. Um. The the. The series title is the Sacred Stone series. Um, what does that title allude to? So um, all of the kingdoms in this land are based around different gemstones. Um, the sort of lore is that that is what these people believe created their earth is like the core is made up of all these different stones that are like worshipped like gods. Gotcha. Well, Dawn of Onyx has re-released now. It's available everywhere. Go visit your local bookstore, pick up a copy of it. Um, if you don't have a great local local bookstore near you, God forbid, uh, but we're going to put links in the show notes this episode where you can grab it from, uh, from Amazon. Uh, Kate, I have not gotten a chance to listen to the audio book yet. Have you? Yes. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> it, it's they in my queue. Exactly it's it, well. it's coming up and it's uh, it's going to be one of the next ones I listen to. So I'm excited to re-experience this book again. Um, what What's the audio book experience been like for you to, to kind of hear your story interpreted by someone and, you know, to kind of embody the story? That's sometimes a pretty surreal experience. It is totally a surreal experience. It is. This is really cheesy, but I, when I first, when my producer first sent me the finished audiobook, they're like, okay, it's done. I, I said to um, a friend of mine, I was like, if nobody likes this book, if nobody reads it, if it just disappears into the ether, I am just so grateful that, you know, I got to write something that I can't stop listening to. Like it, it doesn't feel the same as reading your book. Cause obviously yeah. you know, you've been through so many edits, you've read it a hundred times, but hearing someone else tell the story and, and Ruby and Joe did the most spectacular job. They sound just like how they sound in my head. Um, it, it's, it, it was incredible. It was really special. So fun. So fun. A Dawn of Onyx available everywhere. Now go grab your copy uh, get ready for book two, A Promise of Peridot coming, coming up not too long. Um, 
April. We can do it. <laughs> Kate, if uh, if folks are just discovering you and want to dig into all the great stuff that's coming up, is there a place online where they can follow along for upcoming news and anything uh, new coming out? Yeah, um, I'm on Instagram, um, Kate Golden Author. I'm on TikTok, same thing, but with um, underscore Kate underscore Golden underscore Author. Um, and they, yeah, I think, I guess I have a website, Kate Golden Books. I realize they should all be the same, but they're not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes it just works that way. Um, but we'll we'll link up all those places in the show notes to make it easier for folks to find you. Um, a Dawn of Onyx, go grab it today. Kate, this has been so much fun chatting. Thank so you so fun. much for being generous with your time today. Thank you so much for having me. This was wonderful.